Welcome everyone to Penn State uh, Startup Weeks. Innovation Happens Anywhere uh, panel, keynote panel session, followed by a meet and greet. Uh, my name is Dr. Clark. I'm director of the Farrell Center for Corporate Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I'm also a clinical professor of innovation entrepreneurship here at the Smeal College of Business. Uh, in, in addition to have too, having too many words in my title, I'll also be the moderator tonight for this session. Um, while many of us think of uh, entre entrepreneurship as primarily a startup endeavor, uh, it's also an essential feature of established organizations. In the context of an established enterprise, um, we commonly refer to um, entrepreneurship as intrapreneurship, if you haven't heard that word before. And intrapreneurship will be the focus of our conversation this evening. So without further ado, I would like to welcome the four distinguished guests that, we, uh, that comprise our keynote panel session tonight. Stacy Gleason, Steve Baker, Jennifer Duke, and Melanie Haggerty. Please give them a warm uh, welcome, please. <laughs> I'd like to take just a moment to uh, introduce each of our keynote panelists uh, just briefly, and then we'll move from there. First, um, I'm going to kind of move from your left to right. We'll begin with Stacy Gleason. She's a proud Penn State alum, mm -hmm. is part of the incubator team for Munich Reinsurance America, Inc. Munich Re is one of the largest reinsurance firms in the country and helps its clients understand and manage the risks inherent in their business, businesses. The central role of Stacy's team is creating new ways to serve its clients and drive, drive top-line growth for the business. Steve Baker is next, is head of medicinal chemistry and DMPK. What does that stand for? Drug, metab drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics. Thank you very much. <laughs> at GlaxoSmithKline, one of the world's leading pharma companies, where he leads a number of research teams along with both uh, clinical and discovery programs. Steve is a fellow of the UK Royal Society of Chemistry and has more than 45 publications and patents. Steve did postdoctoral work here at Penn State, which directly led to his work in biotech startup called Anacor Pharmaceuticals. Um, then we also have and like, would like to welcome Jennifer Duke. She is Director of Aerodynamics within Pratt & Whitney Engineering, where she provides both technical and strategic leadership for a number of businesses including turbines, compressors, combustors, acoustics, and etc. Jennifer uh, joined Pratt & Whitney, <laughs> Pratt and Whitney in 1992 and has enjoyed a long, su successful career with the aerospace leader. Then next we also have Melanie Haggerty. She is Vice President of Innovation for Cubic Corporation where she leads Cubic's innovation objectives along with the co-development of solutions with customers. Melanie has extensive experience as an engineering leader which includes her time in the Air Force where she served an, uh, um, an electronics and, as an electronics and radar engineer. Once again, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, I'd like to, um, to begin by giving each of you a little bit of time uh, as panelists to further introduce, you, introduce yourselves if you wish and offer a few remarks. Um, and so I would ask each of you to share a brief example of innovation in your company sort of give, uh, and in your organization, in order to kind of give the audience a better understanding about how it works, how entrepreneurship works in your organizations. Then afterwards, we will take questions from the audience, so please prepare your questions. Uh, we'll begin with you, Stacey. Of course, thank you. So thinking about this question, I work for a global reinsurance company that's 100 years old, almost 101 years old. So an innovation story to share with you for a large organization who specializes in a very um, specific area, we typically always believe we know everything. We're the experts in our business. Um, so the biggest innovation piece that I've learned in our innovation practice 
is failing fast and actually killing ideas or concepts as quickly as possible. And you might say that seems really odd. Aren't you trying to introduce something into the marketplace um, that's different for your customers? But actually for us, learning how to fail fast and be quicker in decisions is extremely important because we tend to uh, take previously a long, long time because we think we know best versus going outside of our building and finding out what our customer uh, needs. So I would say over the last two years, I have finally learned how to sort of stop efforts more quickly. Sometimes it took me four months. Most recently, I've been able to kill something in a month. And, and that's huge for an organization like us. So not all ideas are worth bringing to the market. We need to have many of them, and some of them will get there. Um, but learning how to sort of kill things quickly um, has been somewhat innovative for us as a large organization. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, you didn't expect that one? Well, no, the lifetime of your projects is a whole lot faster than pharma. With we're decades, we're 10, 15 years to get a product. So, so, uh, so I uh, was a postdoc here at Penn State uh, back in the late 90s, and uh, we developed some, uh, some novel chemistry in the labs here of uh, Professor Benkovic. And uh, from that, we spun out a, a company. Professor Benkovic uh, created a company called Anacor, and we took the technology out of Penn State into the company, and we, we built it up from there. Um, Professor Benkovic took the right approach, I think, of not being the CEO and bringing in a professional business team because that was something that I think was really crucial for us to move forward, uh, recognizing that, that the science by itself can't create the business. And so having a professional business team in there, we were able to grow the company <clears throat> excuse me, and focus on the product. So we weren't, I'd come out of academic research and we were quite happy to go off in different directions and try and understand some of the more interesting science, but the interesting science doesn't necessarily lead to the product. So this professional business team came in and really helped us drive the science forward, and together we worked as a business and a science to drive it, to drive it uh, to, to success. So I was with the company for about 10 years. The company then went on and um, uh, did create two products that are now on the market, and that company was acquired by Pfizer two years ago. Uh, about five years ago, then, I moved to GlaxoSmithKline, which is a much bigger company. There's 100,000 employees worldwide. Much, much different to a, smart, a startup biotech. Um, what I found there was really interesting. I was kind of expecting that there was going to be a lot of uh, uh, follow-on uh, 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 projects, you know, taking what other people have done and trying to improve upon them. But what I was really excited to see was, was the scientists, doesn't matter, big company, small company, they were all the same, looking for innovation, driving the programs, driving, trying to drive the products forward, uh, trying to come up with new ideas, and so I, I, I very pleased to be able to lead a, a group into developing novel, uh, novel antibiotics. Uh, one of the things I did find very interesting, though, was the difference in how people perceive me. So when I was with a small company, a small startup, I'd go into conferences, and people would see me, see my name tag, Steve Baker, Anacor, don't really know who that is, and you know, carried on you know, to the next person. When I got my GSK name tag, uh, going there representing a much bigger company, suddenly I realized how people perceive me differently, that I'd walk in, People were really interested in my, in, in my opinions and what I had to say. What I realized is it's less about me and more about the big company. And so then you realize there's a huge corporate responsibility you have of, of what you're saying and how you're saying it. And especially with a company like GlaxoSmithKline, they have a lot of products to sell. You've got to be very careful at what you say. And I had uh, quite a bit of training going from small farmer to big farmer in how to handle those questions, how to understand those, how to recognize those. So, uh, lots of innovation happening, big companies, small companies, uh, but also different responsibilities between uh, the different types of companies as well. All right. Um, well, thank you all for coming. So um, I've spent 25 years um, in the gas turbine engine um, development business. And um, the one thing that I've learned over the 25 years is that um, innovation happens um, at Pratt Whitney at various levels. Um, from a very small scale um, at a part level, you have an interesting idea um, to help um, improve the material capability in the hot section of the motor, or you have an interesting idea for high lift aerodynamics that are going to um, save in terms of part costs um, by reducing the number of airfoils um, in a given turbine stage. Um, so there's a, some of the ideas that could happen at a, a very small scale. 
um, up to you know, the module level and then up to very large scale um, at a system level where um, you're coming up with an innovative idea for a different architecture of the engine. And at the end of the day, it's all about bringing customer value. Um, it's a very competitive business um, that has a very long life cycle, a very long life cycle to develop because it'll often take about 10 years um, from the kind of idea, some of the early technology ideas to uh, developing those ideas for the product and then actually certifying the product, um, then going through aircraft certification and fielding a product that's going to be out um, basically in the industry flying passengers around for 40 or 50 years. Um, so the innovation happens along a very long um, lifespan. Um, and it's, a, it's really a consistency of purpose um, in terms of, you know, you talked about failing fast. There's also a consistency of purpose of thinking about, well, what are the business needs going to be a decade, two decades out? And thinking about, well, what kind of technologies and investments um, do I have to make that will bring value um, to the customer 20, 30 years out? And so sometimes, you know, the thought process around that has worked. Um, we've spent um, decades developing a product that's doing very well. Sometimes um, the forecasting maybe hasn't worked where we'll spend a lot of time developing a product. And, you know, the economics shift and different things are important, um, different values um, are important to our customers. Um, so the one thing I'll say is um, I've really had the pleasure over my 25 years to kind of be on both ends of that, of, of really growing up on a development program where I got to see it all the way from technology to design to validation to entry into service where by the time we got to that point, um, you know, the market had shifted and the aircraft manufacturers were selling um, different families of aircraft, so we, we didn't produce a lot of those engines. Um, to a point where we're at now, um, where I'll say in 25 years, we have got more um, development programs and technology programs than we've ever had. Um, and, you know, we are at, the, at a point where um, we develop product for our commercial fleet, where um, we look back about, um, I would say, 14 years ago, and um, it was when Boeing was launching um, the 787 design. And we were, you know, our company was actually rallying around a proposal for that. And then um, kind of at the last minute, um, we made an announcement that we would not bid the proposal. We, we thought that technically um, we had a very viable um, proposal, but um, business case wise, um, we decided to go in a different direction. And what we, we were looking at forecasting for um, the cost of fuel was going up. Okay, so fuel economy was important, and reven re revenue passenger miles was expected to like triple by 2030, and the single aisle market and regional market segment was expected to more than double. And so we were looking at that, and we decided to make an investment in the single aisle market, and we decided that we would implement a new architecture around our engine, and it wouldn't be just part level technologies, but we would implement a new architecture that would allow us to um, grow the size um, of the fan to allow us to produce thrust with more mass flow instead of fuel flow. Um, and that revolutionary architecture um, involved a gear um, to decouple the speeds between the fan and the rest of the, of the motor. And so um, it was one of these um, thoughts that had developed over decades where NASA was investing in different concepts. We learned um, by perfecting the architecture what worked, what didn't, um, to the point of failing fast. You know, sometimes you don't completely give up on the idea. You say, well, this wasn't the right idea. Let me perfect it. And so it was really a consistency of purpose. And there was a business need that we saw. And the readiness kind of all came together. And so I had the pleasure of working that um, in a leadership position in, in the design phase. Then I was given a different opportunity for our legacy fleet working aftermarket for a while. And then I came back um, in the position of, of the senior director where I actually saw um, that product being validated and certified. And so it's a matter of, you know, the ideas have to make it all the way through some very rigorous testing. Um, it has to survive under many different environmental conditions. Um, and so, you know, what I appreciate is it's not just a matter of the design ideas that come to fruition. It's kind of about the tools and the methods that we develop along the way that's also you know, a source of innovation um, throughout the department. Um, just in the way we test, the different test techniques, the different 
types of instrumentation <coughs> techniques. Um, all of those are sources of innovation. And so whether you're designing um, a part, designing a system, designing instrumentation, um, making new tools and methods, all of those are areas of innovation across the business. And then just in the business itself and how we work with the customers, the type of um, proposals, the type of arrangements um, we make. You know, we've shifted our business model from being one in the aftermarket where um, we make money off of kind of selling um, repair and repair parts, um, replacement parts to now where we get power by the hour. So, you know, we actually want to keep the engines on wing for our business model. Our customers want to keep them on wing so that they're not disrupting, you know, by, by um, replacing the engines. So, it, you know, innovation kind of happens across the business and in many different levels um, is what I've come to find out. And, you know, for me, it's just real pleasure to watch something grow from an idea and some small scale testing to, you know, 8,000 engines of backlog and, you know, 130 engines fielded just in the last couple of years over you know, several different operators. So, you know, for me, just getting to see that happen and getting to see the different types of innovation um, that have happened across the organization um, over, you know, that decade was, um, you know, pretty revolutionary for me. Thanks. Uh, so I thought uh, I would start by giving a little bit more uh, context from my background and so that you appreciate that innovation can come from anywhere and it's important to include diverse opinions, diverse inputs. Um, I happen to be a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Okay. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to mention, but I'm from Michigan. I thought I'd get booed out. Sorry. Yeah, I knew I was going to go Irish. That's, That's why they have me sitting over here. I think not far. Uh, but, <laughs> but that aside, uh, a little bit more about Cubic. So Cubic was founded in 1951, and since its founding, uh, we have provided revolutionary contributions to industry based upon innovative technologies. Our main customers happen to be the military, the U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps, U.S. Air Force, uh, the U.S. Army, as well as international militaries worldwide. But we also have a huge customer base in terms of transportation systems. We enable the uh, back office and, and payment transactions that allow people to ride the tube, to ride buses in Chicago, New York, uh, San Francisco, Vancouver. Uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, um, <laughs> seamlessly to work and back home. Uh, so that's the, uh, the transportation systems. We do a lot more data analytics now. Um, we also, in our defense sector, we do a lot of our training systems. So Cubic was the first company to deploy a system, an air combat training system that was based upon GPS. No other company had done it before, and we are still the world leading provider of this air combat training system known as the P5 training system, which also allows for uh, training between fourth generation and fifth generation aircraft. So between an F-16, F-15, and an F-35. Nobody else can do that in the world. Um, and then finally, our cubic mission systems division is responsible for secure communications. Uh, that also has military applications, but also uh, humanitarian aid and disaster relief. Uh, we provided the, uh, the Gator system, which is a ground antenna transmit receive system that actually provided the very first communications in Puerto Rico after the hurricane moved through there. So we were the ones, our system actually enabled the communication, voice, video, uh, internet communications, uh, because the whole point of that very innovative technology, it's not like a, a typical uh, ground antenna system where you need trucks and everything like that. It's one small ball um, that has the antenna dish inside of it. Um, so it's very deployable, very mobile. So really, really quite innovative. Cubic is about an 8,400 size, people sized um, company. So not a huge, huge company like Pat Whitney um, and not, certainly not a startup. But about, uh, oh, I'd say about five years ago, we realized that we had allowed our innovation to become too formalized in terms of research and development. And we needed to allow the inclusion of individual engineers and non-engineers, people that had really good ideas to bring disruptive thinking to Cubic. So we enabled an ideation platform that allowed individuals to basically kind of jump the chain of command, so to speak, and to just submit a good idea, provide the justification for why they thought that that idea would actually work, 
And, um, and then we now have this parallel line of innovation at Cubic that allows for that social collaboration. I think that's a really important thing um, for innovation. It's, um, you know, when you think of formal research and development pro um, projects, sometimes they're a very isolated team. They're very focused on what they're doing. Innovation has to be really collaborative because it really builds on other people's inputs, and we really value that at Cubic. Um, as an example of one uh, recent innovation project um, that has actually gone through the multiple phases at Cubic is our, um, it's a called the Tactical Observer Metrics Enhancer System, or TOME. And um, basically what it does is it utilizes um, AI algorithms, which are not new in and of themselves, but how we employ them that makes the difference, that brings value to the customer. Um, we specialize in instrumentation systems for ground troops. Uh, so basically, if you think of it as a very complex laser tag system so that the Marines and the Army can go out and train for a specific mission and they, you know, they can shoot at one another without really you know, killing one another, they have this laser system, um, that um, instrumentation system that will actually sense if they've been hit or missed, et cetera. Um, but for those types of missions uh, or training exercises, you go out, you do your training exercise, you come back and you get a debrief, and then that's the end. What we're now trying to do is to add value to that by providing the data analytics that will provide trends over time to actually change and inform the behavior of the participant at the individual level, the unit level, the squadron, and the battalion level, so that um, they are really being trained effectively so that the, the so that they can go and do their mission and then come back safely, of course. Uh, the other new innovative part of that is that our systems are now implementing biometric sensors so that we can also um, track um, and also uh, we'll track heart rate uh, so that we can see if an individual's heart rate spikes and hydration levels so that we can tell if a person is um, you know, becoming dehydrated. You don't want that to happen during a training exercise. Mm -hmm. And so the system has implemented, implemented these new sensors and, and biometric feedback to allow us to ensure everybody is safe during the training exercises. So um, in this particular innovation, it started as a hackathon event that Cubic sponsored and facilitated. Um, it did well in that hackathon. We then, um, over the course of the summer, we actually had a student intern work on it. So at Cubic, we really, really like to have talented, motivated student interns. We put them right to work. We embed them right with our project and engineering team to get that new way of um, thinking. And then um, from there, it became a, for a more formalized IRAD project. Uh, we developed a preliminary um, proof of concept. And now we are actually deploying an operational tablet system, almost like a test system, in the field um, in these training exercises so that we get feedback from our customers. So now we are co-collaborating and co-creating with the customer. And at Cubic, um, like I said, it's very much all about providing value to the customer. We want to co-create as much as possible and of course um, it's also bringing in new revenue streams and that's that's true whether or not you're a startup or a big mm -hmm. company. It's mm -hmm. all about bringing in the new revenue streams. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving us a, a glimpse into innovation as it is in your established organizations um, and for showing your passion for innovation. What we'd like to do now is turn the time over to the audience for your questions. Uh, we have um, an audience here, but uh, in addition to a group that's online. So please um, raise your hand if you have a question. We'll go from there. I'm fascinated by your ability to kill off an idea in 30 days. Um, how do you, you know, what are the data inputs that you use to, to kind of make that informed decision? Because, you know, I, I'd like to fail fast too. And that seems really aggressive. And I was just curious how to, how to recreate your magic. I'm glad you say it's aggressive. I've been told at work it's not aggressive enough with it too of our timetables. But uh, some of the things we do to help us make that decision is we look at the components as if you were doing using the tool like Lean Canvas as well. Uh, so we first look if we're working with a startup company. A lot of times the startup companies are coming to us since we're a big global organization um, as well. And they're looking for our capabilities of insurance paper plus we do reinsurance as well. So we will assess the startup and we'll understand their people. Um, it's really important that we understand their skills and what they bring. I think Steve, sort of to your point, what resonated with me is making sure you have a true CEO, someone with that skill set. 
And sometimes at these startups, you might have someone extremely technical with it, but they don't have the business mind. So we look at the people aspect of it. We also look at the customer. What customer market are they going after? And we judge that then on our own. So the startup will bring to us to collaborate that the market size is you know, $100 million of possible revenue. We go double check that, right? Like we make sure we do our homework to understand what that market size is, as well as does the customer have a problem to solve? So we'll do that work um, as well. So on the people at the startup company, at the customer, at the market size, we'll look to see is there competition? Is there some other alternative out there? So we'll go through those components and actually just use a very simple traffic light symbol of do we think one of those elements we agree with the market size, so it's green. Do we have some real concerns? Is there really a problem here to solve? So maybe that's red. Maybe we're a little cautious about the people. We're not so sure about them as well. So we'll go through an assessment like that um, with working with a startup. So that's just one example. And, and then you just gotta make the tough decision. Is like, is this worth moving forward? It's not necessarily um, scientific. It's just, should we be putting our resources towards this effort? Because we get approached every day by startup companies to collaborate with as well. But we need to be a little selfish of where we put our resources as a large organization. And, and then you just get more of that gut check of, is this something that we think we can bring to market or not? Um, we do a little bit different um, opportunity type of analysis on internal ideas. So if we're not working with a startup company, we have employees who can present to us ideas as well. And then we've trained, um, we have a program where we help them expand that idea and the opportunity analysis. And we go through it again of what's the market size? Um, you know, can we make $100 million is what we care about at scale. Um, is there really a customer problem? Have you talked to any customers, right? Like, have you gotten out of your building where you're working and actually mm -hmm. gone to talk to customers too? So we go through that same assessment we try to do that quickly. We time box things is the only way, otherwise you can let it drag along. And we time box it um, to make um, a decision there. Wasn't easy at first, believe me, I've worked on some things that has gone months, if not even a year, um, before making that decision to kill. But as we practice more of that, we're, we're getting better. So just like exercising, right, it's tough to make it a habit. But once if you make it a habit, you can get a little bit faster as well. So it takes some real discipline. Uh, and our leadership within the Munich Re organization, too, is, is holding us to that. And, and that really helps in my role as an entrepreneur and trying to bring something to the market. It helps me when I have someone on top of me making sure I can make those decisions more quickly. You're welcome. Does anyone else have something to add to the conversation? Yeah, I have um, some to reflect differently on, okay. on, on the same kind of mm -hmm. thing. In, in my industry, you know, uh, medicines, it, it takes 15 years to get something on the market. So mm -hmm. research will typically last you know, two, three years before mm -hmm. we get it out of, out of uh, research into, into the clinic. So we have a, a really hard time being able to track progress mm -hmm. in, in, in day by day. You can see it month by month. So we, 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 it's really hard for us to try and make those decisions. Mm. Uh, but what is really, really important is making the decision, mm. right? And, and you pointed it out with, um, you know, the, the longer it takes to make that decision, the more money you can lose if it's, if it's a negative res result. In our case, uh, you know, I work in the antibacterial area. And, and the thing that helps us make decisions is to set the criteria up front. What do we want to achieve in what time frame? And so we break it down by year, by quarter, and almost by month. And then we track progress to see how close we get to that. Quite often, you, you're always more optimistic and you always set the bar <laughs> a little bit higher. Yeah. Um, and and what, I, what I tend to look for is a trajectory. Are we getting close to that? Are we moving to that? If we're not hitting our target, how far off the target are we? Are we flatlining? And so it, we're looking at this and trying to make decisions all the time. It is really, really easy to not make a decision and just let it keep going. Uh, the thing that drives me, uh, I work in the antibacterial area, so we're trying to find new antibiotics. If we have the correct program that's going to lead to a drug, every time, it, well, every week that goes by that we don't get the drug on the market, there's up to 500 lives lost. Mm. So as we make decisions, that is in the forefront of my mind. I want to try and get the medicine to the patient as quick as we can, and it's not going to be quick, 
But if I'm delaying decisions, I've got to really understand what the impact of that decision is. And every time I delay it by a week, a month, there's patients that could take benefit of that, of that project. Mm. On the other hand, if the project's not going to work, I've got a bunch of resources on a program that's really not going to deliver to a patient. So how do I get the, the resources off that program and onto a program that can be successful? Mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately, we're never going to have all the data at any one time to help make the clear decision. Most of the times, it's never a clear decision. So quite often, you have to take the, uh, the opinion of the, and the experience around us. And we, we use those criteria measures to see how close we're getting. And at some point, you've just got to make that call and, and you know, be brave making those decisions. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I would just say similar to what Steve <coughs> described. Um, you know, it's not necessarily about failing fast. It's about learning fast and making decisions mm -hmm. based on the learning um, that you get. Because, you know, similar um, to your industry, when you're talking about a product that takes a decade mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to develop, you're kind of on the trajectory where you have milestones along the way. There are learning point milestones along the way. And whether you um, have to rig test it, you know, kind of take a component and just test it up to like a full scale engine demonstration where we'll run demonstration tests um, just to get the learning to see how we evolve and perfect the product. Um, but to the point, the data sets are never perfect, mm -hmm. um, neither is the analysis. So it's a matter of, um, you know, really getting the insight for what did I learn and um, to kill off some of the ideas and to say, look, we need to leave that behind and we need to move towards something else. Um, but I would say that it's, it's kind of about learning, learning fast, um, because in getting the engines to test quickly um, is something that we're um, very focused on. You could spend a lot of time in the analysis phase, but it's really when you get the system integrated is where you really learn from it. Um, and so it's a, you know, about constant evolution um, just from the learning points along the way. I just, very quickly, I would just say that's, a, that's an area that Cubic strive to get better at. Um, I think a lot of what drives Cubic is uh, our, our engineering pride. Uh, we very much like to think we have the best solution, and uh, sometimes we really have to prove it to ourselves that there is something better out there. Um, and that, that means that we have to let go of our own organic solution. Um, so that's, that's something hard, something very individual, I think. But uh, we're, we're getting better at it. Emotion can get in the way, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. yeah, We're very attached to our ideas. Yeah, you can really love your idea so much that mm -hmm. you have a hard time not only letting go, but even changing because you just think you have the best thing. And, and I think that's what just takes a practice right. with it, too. Thank you so much. Let's go to the next question, please. Hi, um, my name is Amarachi. So my question is kind of in line with um, failing fast. I'm wondering, like, how do you, because a lot of people have, like, a negative, like, view on failure. So how do you go about like creating that culture where like people understand that it's actually okay to fail and they can like better pick themselves up after like the failure or like after you shut down your project of like a month or 15 years? Great, great question. Um, I think one of the important things is making sure that it's senior management that they celebrate those moments because it is tied to learning that Jen mentioned as well. So I find if our senior management uh, talks about it, that it's not you know, taboo to talk about it and they, they recognize it and that they demonstrate that if I just take myself as an example, that I'm still working in the innovation area, even though we might have taken too long on some ideas before making that decision, but I'm encouraged to learn and practice again. I think that begins to go a long way. But when you talk about culture, um, th that's a long process to, to change that, especially when you're working in a corporate culture uh, that is the expertise on things and has rewarded for success and, and bringing in new revenue quickly with new clients and the sense that well, have we brought in any new revenue yet? And maybe we haven't, but that's okay because the learnings are gonna move us along. So I, I really do think it's very much senior management, being open, having conversations, but then all fellow employees, seeing others go through it, and they're still there working, they're still encouraged to learn um, as well. Uh, so hopefully there's encouragement to say, 
well, Stacy has struggled with this, but look, she's still working on these other efforts as well. That must be accepted too. She's been there 25 years, a long time, and it's an acceptance of that learning process, even for someone who's been in the industry um, that long. I'd, I'd be curious on others, because culture, culture question on that of innovation is, um, I think, a very dif a difficult yeah. one and can be different in different industries. Yeah, there's a couple of things that, that, that I've done, or we've done at my previous company, Anacor, and we do the same at, at GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, and one of them, is, is, so one part of it is, is uh, mission statement and uh, core values. And when Anacor first started talking about creating a mission statement and creating core values, I'm just thinking, I'm a scientist, I'm like, this is just mumbo jumbo. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of thing that corporate bodies do that just, just kind of make it look good, sound good, I, I don't know. But then I actually realized that they are, they're really important to a company because it really sets the tone of that company and it sets the tone of the people and it sets the tone of the culture. Uh, the, um, the mission statement and the, and the core values, both at Anacor that I worked at and GSK that I now work at, is patient first. Every decision is patient first. Forget the finance side of it. If we're doing our job right, patients will use the medicine, the company will make money. Forget the money side of it. Patient first. So every decision we make is around the patient. So if a pro program is not going to work and you're emotionally attached to it, it's easy to let go of it by saying, you know what, this is not going to help the patient. And so you can step mm -hmm. back from that. Both companies had that, that philosophy. So we worked really hard around the mission statement. When I joined GSK, it's one of the things I then looked at. What's, what is their mission statement? Does it fit my values as a person, as a scientist? And when it did, that made, made it easier for me to join the company and fit into the company. So, so mission statement and core values to me became something actually more than mumbo jumbo. It became very important mm -hmm. as part of the company. Um, the other part is how we educate ourselves to make decisions. So one of the things that I've learned and, and we, we talk about a lot is the data. The data is the data. If a study works, it works. If it doesn't, it, it, it fails, right? I can't change that and, and you know, I shouldn't change that. I can't fudge the data and say, well, actually, the experiment did work by redesigning the experiment or, 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 or fudging the results. The data is the data. You don't mess with it. So you know, one of the things that we teach our staff a lot about is we can manage the process, but we should just accept the data for what it is. Mm -hmm. So as long as we've done the right studies, we've done the right chemistry, the right biology, we're making the right compounds, we're studying them in the right way, that's well under our control. Whatever the data is, we have to accept for what it is. And so when the data comes out negative, we can all sit down and go to the bar on a Friday night and drown <laughs> our sorrows. But you know, we have to accept what it is. And we say, you know, as long as we've done the right process, we have to accept the data. And, and I think that may, helps, it, it helps people come to terms with negative mm -hmm. data. Yeah, I, honestly, I think um, similar to what Stacy and Steve were saying, that it has to do a lot with culture. And um, we're at a point at Pratt & Whitney where we have so many new um, products that we fielded and so many new programs um, that we are, and, and a lot of new hires as well, I mean just in engineering over 1,500 or so new hires over the last um, couple of years where um, we're trying to get out that it is okay to take prudent risks, responsible risks, um, and it is okay to, you know, to fail. It's not necessarily about the failure and or the learning that comes out it's about how you react to it um, you know we used to use taglines like flawless execution and in the jet engine business there you know there's almost like no such thing you know when you have parts that are operating at 2400 degrees rotating at 22,000 rpm that have a clearance between the rotating part and the static part that's thinner than a, a sheet of paper you know, it's, very, uh, it's a very meticulous design. It needs to be learned out. It's about getting the learning and reacting to it quickly um, to still meet the customer commitments. And so we've kind of shifted the culture to be um, to one of that's learning, that's accepting of the learning, accepting of failure, but the ability to, to recover and to meet the customer needs. And many of us, um, went through, I just went through a training um, at the end of last year at West Point Academy um, where the Army actually teaches this. You know, in other words, there's no such thing as flawless execution. The game's constantly changing. Once you're out in the battlefield, um, you'll learn things new. You have to, it's about your ability um, to operate under a volatile environment mm -hmm. and um, to, to change how you're doing things. And so they implement things like, you know, 
creating a very robust plan, testing your plan with the experts, drawing in. We have technical fellows that we draw in. Um, we have um, people who you know, are experts outside of the company, maybe that have retired from the company that we bring in to test our plan. It still doesn't work perfectly. Um, but we're also bringing in this concept of, we call them after, the Army calls them after action reviews. And they don't just happen after you run a big test, they happen every day where you, you get people together and you say, okay, how did that go? How did we perform? What should have happened? What did happen? What did we learn from it? And what are we gonna do next time to kind of you know, make things better? And if you start getting those kind of conversations in the culture, it doesn't seem punitive when things don't go the way you expect because they almost never do. Mm -hmm. It seems like, no, you're constantly reflecting on what just happened and thinking about how did we perform. You know, their instinct is to say, well, this would have gone a lot better had I had this or had so-and-so not put this constraint on me. But at the end of the day, we're all operating under the environment that's given to us that we're, we're in, and we have to kind of look back and reflect how are we performing um, in that um, environment. And I kind of use it as self-reflection as well, mm. um, you know, just to myself, you know, what did I do? Or should I have thought about that differently? Should I have been more proactive a couple of years ago, um, you know, when the team started to see, you know, this was going on? And so I, I think that it's just something, in, and it can be used just in academia, can be used throughout your careers, but the whole thought process of constantly reflecting on how you're performing given the environment that you're in and what you could have done differently, what you would have done differently, what you're gonna do the next time is um, more of the conversation that we're having um, with, our, with our people and that we're expecting our leaders to have with their teams, if that makes sense. Uh. I agree with all that, yeah. so I'm good. Yeah. Move on to the next <laughs> all right, thank you. Let's move to the next question, please. Bring, bring. bring down a mic. Uh, so it seems that all of you work for work for big companies. So I feel I myself is too innovative that I want to start my own business. Uh, so what I'm what am I supposed to do uh, to prepare for it? Uh, so what do you think? It's just a, an open question. Do we want to switch it up and start down? <laughs> yeah, not, wait, so no. let me make sure. So you're asking how you would start your own company or why you should pursue maybe an entrepreneurship at a larger company? Uh, so what uh, should I prepare to start my own business? Yes, what, maybe what, um, based on your experience with large organizations, could you tell someone who wants to start a small company based on what you've learned? Uh, be, be prepared to work really, really, really hard. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know um, I've always worked in a big business or I've worked in the Air Force, so it's a little bit hard for me to provide probably the best. Um, actually, Steve might be the better, yes. the better yeah. candidate since <laughs> you were. It, it, there's no magic formula. Right, it, it's working hard is is really important, and and you know I worked hard in a small company. I'm still working hard in a big company. Um, I, I find innovation the same in both. Um, the, the reward in a small company if it's successful is really big, though. So that's always worth uh, <laughs> <laughs> worth considering. Um, I think the challenge for 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 us starting a small company was really understanding business. You know, we were academics. Uh, we were coming out of academic labs. We, you know, thought ourselves great scientists. We thought we had some great science. Uh, people were interested in what we were doing. So we, we got a lot of external um, validation of the things that we were doing. Uh, we went to experts in the field and, and they, they seemed interested in the technology we were trying to move out of Penn State. Um, I, I think on reflection, I was really pleased to see a professional business group involved helping us. Because what we do, and, and I think you described this very well too, is, is it's a business and a science, right? You, if the science just shoots off in any direction, you, you can create something that the market doesn't want. And, and then there's no value to your company. So one of the things that we learned was how do we create value to the company? And how do you get people working together in that same system? There was tons of science that I wanted to follow, but we didn't because it was gonna, not going to lead to anything of value. So. As we set out the business, it was really trying to understand what is it we're trying to create? What is the first product? And we're not talking about that big vision far out of, you know, we want to be the world's best company, best pharmaceutical company. It's how do we create a product that's going to help patients? And, and, and then backing up from there 
And then you find that you start going with the science, but the science will go off in a different, you know, will start, you know, it's not really working down this route. So what are you going to do then? You know, so, so, so business has said, you know, make this product. The science is saying it's not really going to work. But the science will tell you it could work over here. So now you've got to go back to business and say, is there an opportunity over in this direction? So you take these baby steps with the business and the science uh, to, to identify the right product and move it forward. So, so for us, I, I think the early days of Anacor were, were critically important. I mean, we were working hundreds of hours a week. Uh, I mean, it was crazy. There, were, there was 15 of us, uh, you know, business science, uh, really trying to make the company successful. It was a lot of fun because everybody was really, really important. Uh, and every milestone you met increased the value of the company, and you could see that, and you could share in some of that as well. We had, you know, we had stock in the company, not that we could sell it back then. So it was really, for us, what was really important was, was creating the products. If you can create the products, you can raise money, or if you can hit the milestones, you can raise money. If you don't have money, you can't go forward. And the only way you're going to get money is through investors. And the only way you get, they're going to invest in you is you're showing success, and you're showing you're moving along that pathway. So the early days before we even started talking about partnership discussions with, with any uh, potential partners, uh, it was really just trying to make sure that, that we, we were focused on, on creating a product, that the business was helping us create a valuable product, um, and, so, and, and that the science was working. And, and so I'd say probably after the first two years is when we started talking to businesses, other companies, to see if they were interested in what we, what we wanted, because it was clear that we weren't going to be able to take things to market. So pharmaceutical industry is hundreds of millions for a single product, and, and there's no way we could raise that kind of money. Uh, so, so we had to make sure then at some point we had to start engaging potential partners. Now you need experience in the company that knows those partners, knows who they are, how they operate, um, you know, how a big company operates and the kind of things a big company is looking for. So when, a, when a, a small company, now I've been on both sides, a small company will go to a pitch uh, at a big company, how do you capture them in, in a few minutes and show them what your product is, why it's valuable, and why you need to create a partnership? Uh, and knowing that the big companies see a lot of different small companies, so how do you stick out amongst those small companies? Uh, for us, I think it was really just success. Keep building scientific success and keep moving it forward towards a product. The, the one thing, Steve, that comes to mind as you were talking about that, that hit me too, if you're starting a company, is depending on what vertical or area you're looking at. So for example, if it is something in mobility or in uh, some other discipline area, maybe even simply technology, there are these things called accelerators um, out there. So I don't know if individuals are familiar with them. Um, but all across the U.S., it seems like they're opening up in cities all over the place that there's an organization out there, and they'll usually specialize in a certain vertical that you could go to. Um, there's different ways to get engaged with them, but that's where I have met um, individuals with ideas that are trying to form a company, and they're getting the training they need. They're getting the coaching they need. So whether you could get yourself part of an appropriate accelerator program or finding a lot of times, there's a lot of advisors out there. There's so many individuals that I've connected with who've worked with big, large industries who now have moved into roles where they're advising um, startup companies or individual with even ideas. They're not even a company yet because they believe um, in them and what they're bringing and they help coach them along the way. That is so valuable if you can find a program or an individual out there to help you formulate it um, and through the whole journey. I, I can just even speak for myself as innovation practice within a large organization. We even reach out to external individuals to help coach us because we need that external viewpoint. We need someone from different industries. So I work with a CEO startup. I work with a CTO startup as well. Yes, we have those individuals in our organization, but I need to be coached on someone who started their own business um, as well. That's the mindset I need. I can only get that from someone who's, who's done that and willing to spend time coaching. So I, I definitely think there's other resources available um, to help you in that early stage as well, much more so than you know, 25 years ago or so. Well, let me build on that just a second. Part of startup is around those kind of resources. Thursday down at the hub from noon to two, 
they're going to have a resource fair in the meantime space about the incubators, the accelerators, the resources that are here at Penn State to help you with those things. So, whereas we can't spend more time than talking about them here at the panel, it is a great place for you to go and learn about the all one place on Thursday. So it's another part of the service. Commercial's over. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that commercial, Dave. <laughs> Really appreciate it. No, that's, that's, a, that's something we should take advantage of if you have interests in what resources exist around Penn State. And it's a, entrepreneurship innovation is a major strategic priority for the university. There is a lot out there that you can, a lot of help you can get and a lot of resources you can obtain. We're, we're beginning to kind of run low on time, so I wanted to kind of get this out there for the, for the panel. We'll start with you, Melanie, but as we walk away, um, I want to ask the obligatory question that comes up in almost all panels at universities, and that is, if you were a student today, what kind of advice would you give them about how to shape a career that points them towards entrepreneurship, innovation, and entrepreneurship? Things that you might have done differently had, had you relived your life again. Mm. Hmm. Let's see, I think... Uh, hmm. I think it's really important to um, compel yourself to and propel yourself by being willing to take risks. Um, I think uh, to take the classes or take advantage of opportunities where you have to kind of go outside yourself um, to um, either through, um, you know, even volunteering um, community service even to recognize, you know, real customers and understanding um, people because you're always making a product for, for people, obviously. Um, I think um, if I were to redo it again, I think I would, um, I was very engineering centric um, as a student. I think um, I probably would take some economics or, or mm -hmm. more business classes um, to get more of the really business side of that um, because I was so totally focused on how do I how do I create something? How do I create the technology and understanding the technology without really having the appreciation for the really important financial side of, of innovation? So I would say that would be, that's what I would do over. Um, mm. if, I, if I could tell my younger self, you mm. know, make sure to take some business classes. Mm. Um, yeah, for me, I would say that um, when you're going into a new job, a new position, of any sort is, you know, first of all, demonstrating the intellectual curiosity to really learn about the business, to ask questions, to not just accept, well, this is the way we do things. Um, you know, we have, in our organizations, we have um, kind of standards um, that we live by that kind of um, have, reflect the learning of the past, but it's never sufficient. It may, might be necessary, but it's never sufficient for when you're trying to grow capability. And so I would say that to have the intellectual curiosity to think about how do you um, expand um, what you're doing into something that's new um, and by asking questions, by learning from the people um, that have you know, developed um, capability um, in your area in the past, um, but just really demonstrating that initiative and intellectual curiosity first. Um, I always say, um, you know, there are people that like to come in, they, they know they want to be leaders, but you have to develop some sort of discipline in an area and expertise. And you don't have to take years and years to do it, um, but I do believe that a good leader, at least in a, a very technical company, um, you know, you have a backbone in something. And so being willing to, to learn a discipline or learn a trade is always very good. Um, before you move into leadership um, and you know people your resume should be filled with accomplishments um, not positions not just positions but accomplishments along the way of what value you brought um, while you were in those positions and so that's you know what I would give um, as advice um, you know I would say that um, the collaborative nature um, is almost uh, prerequisite in almost you know every different business and in industry mm -hmm. you know you could have a great idea but you know if you're not um, aware of the surroundings you know around you and the different interfaces um, and different people required to to bring it to fruition then it'll just stay that a, a good idea that doesn't go anywhere so I just say you know, be an intellectual intellectually curious ask questions learn a discipline and um, and be collaborative 
um, would be you know my advice to people and you know formal mentorship somebody asked me about that um, during a lunch today and I always just sought like mentors almost on the fly you know depending on what advice I was seeking I sought people out and never had a formal mentorship but I do think that um, there's many more, you know, kind of formal mentoring programs available in larger companies. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it is worth taking advantage of because oftentimes you can get different perspective and it can you know, make you think about different opportunities you might not be thinking of. So I do think, you know, after you've established yourself for a few years, it is worth pursuing, you know, more of a formal mentorship, um, you know, within a large company if that's what you decide to pursue. It's a really tough question. We get like the, the hard part because the good parts are already gone. I, I was ready to say <laughs> ditto, ditto. But go ahead. I'll probably yeah, say ditto yeah. again too um, and think of some. If addition. I could go back, I'd give myself some really good stock tips. I think that would be something <laughs> that I'd, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'd do. Um, That's actually a good one. <laughs> boy, um, well, one of the things I've been really impressed with here is just the education that you're getting in business. That's something we didn't have when, when I was graduating. Mm. Um, and so I was learning on the fly. I think if I could go back, I'd probably t tell myself to at least open up the business book and start reading about some of this so I had a better idea about business itself. So I could marry business and science together much better, much faster than perhaps I did. Um, I've really enjoyed what I've done. So, so that's my advice to you know, continue enjoying what you do because you're gonna have to work hard at it. If you don't like it, it's, it's gonna be terrible. Um, so really enjoy <laughs> what you do. Find things that you enjoy what you do. Uh, I think, you know, to, to uh, add, add to your, your answer, be good at what you do, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Be good at what you do. Know what you do, right? And know what you can't do well. And build that team around you that fills your weaknesses. And I, know, I don't know whether we can yeah. call it weaknesses or development opportunities now. I don't, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? What I see in the way I try to build my teams, uh, and, and I've learned over, over years, is what are my strengths and, and what are my weaknesses? I hate doing budgets. I hate doing all the finance stuff. So I get people around me that, that are really strong at that, really good at that, and they help me with that. So I can do it if I have to. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. So you know, I, I try to build a team around me now uh, that, that fills the bits that I don't like doing. Um, so development opportunities or, or, you know what, that person really enjoys it. So how, how to build a team. I think I give myself advice on, on what kind of team is around me. I probably tell myself, you know, what are my strengths? Uh, um, the other thing that, that really struck me too, as, as, I, as I was learning, was we have to get products, we have to make products. I no longer make products. I'm no longer at the bench. It's the bench scientists that are making the products. Those are the people that make the money for the entire company because it's the compounds they make, it's the data they generate, it's the science they do. And I manage that, I help resource that. So I don't see them working for me, I work for them. And that's something else that I would have told myself a lot sooner. You know, don't think that you're in this high position and, and you're special. You're not. The people who are special are those at the bench that are doing the grunt work every day because they're the ones that are going to create the products. And so they're the ones you have to make sure they've got everything they need to do their job and, and really try to make, 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 that, make that obvious to them as well. You know, they're, they're really important people. So I think that's the kind of advice I'd probably give myself yeah. if I go back just to kind of Things I've recognized over time, I would have liked to have got a lot, a lot sooner. And I think that would have made me a bit stronger at this point, too. So the two additional items I would share completely agree with what everyone's said. Communication skills. Mm -hmm. No matter what industry you're in, you're going to need to communicate to individuals. And having good communication skills can really make a difference on presenting an idea to your manager if you're starting up a company as well, presenting it to a large organization, extremely important. So if you haven't taken courses to help you with your communication skills, articulating your ideas down, that would be something I would encourage you to do. I was a math major in actuarial science, loved numbers. And it hit me about 10 years into my career how important it would be for me to be able to communicate with others. And it made, it made a difference, whether it's within a team or within the senior management of that organization. 
they'll remember when you communicate well and they'll remember when you struggle too. So that's something that if you haven't started, it's an easy one to start with um, as well, just to put yourself sort of out there in any chance you could get in small groups, large groups, public communication. And finally, the other advice I'd give, which is interesting because it's something I've just recently reflected upon. I've been with the same organization for 25 years. I can network within my organization probably almost like no other. I know who to go to to get things done, whether it's in our information technology, if it's in accounting, or business. Because I've built relationships with those individuals over the years, whether someone's been there for a while or new. So I'm well, very well connected within my organization. But I've realized I'm not well connected outside my organization. And that's something, especially now in innovation practices, is something I need. Um, so the advice I give myself is, yes, make sure you build those relationships wherever you find yourself next. But don't forget to have a broader network there of other individuals. You never know when you need to call upon them for advice. Um, to come help you out on a project as well, or just to get other uh, perspective. Um, so making sure you really have a diverse network of individuals to go to, and that you're constantly um, reaching out to those individuals, I think is um, something just recently that I realized, uh, okay, I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need to work on that and, and build a plan to do that as well. So would have loved someone to even have told me 10 years ago to um, start doing that, but um, that would be just something to begin. Thank you so much for the advice. Hey, now I, uh, we've kind of, we've, we've reached the end of the hour. I'm an educator and I've been taking some notes while we've been having this conversation. I'd like to just throw out a couple of summary uh, takeaways for me because I get to be a sponge and I can take what you, what you share with us and I can share with my <laughs> students in the coming weeks, which I'm going to do. So some things that stood out to me and I'm just gonna quickly go over them if you don't mind before we, before we end tonight. Some of the things that jumped out to me were that leadership matters in setting the tone of innovation in a company. Leadership matters. So some of how the culture works must be uh, top down. And that was an interesting learning. Failure and learning work together. So failing fast, failing smartly, uh, failing strategically, it does play a role in how innovation works in organizations. I thought that was interesting. The word customer comes out a lot, customer and co-creating with customers. So we can't ever lose sight of the customer or the needs of the customer. And that is uh, a message for entrepreneurs as it is for innovators. Um, I love the way you talked about tracking innovation mm -hmm. and how you each do that differently depending on the context and the industry that you're in. For some it takes years, for some months and so forth. But how you do that, red light, green light and so forth, that's a lesson to all of us about how to manage innovation in a large organization. You don't frequently hear killing ideas. We often talk about nurturing ideas. <laughs> and innovation, part of the success of an innovative company is knowing what ideas to kill versus which ones to nurture. That's a question I'm gonna take with me uh, as we walk away. Um, I like the idea too that emotion weds us to ideas. And so it can wed us to good ideas and bad ideas. So be, watch your emotions. They can play to your favor, but they can also blind you to um, errors that you might, or to following the wrong path. Um, I like the concept, you work for the people who make the products. You know, re remember who we're serving. Sometimes we lose sight of that as we get, you know, higher up in the organization. Um, let the data speak, you know, let the, manage the process, but let the, accept what the data says. We can take that to heart. Um, I also think there's a theme here that uh, science and business and engineering, they need each other. They need each other at the university. They need each other in the real world. We, we, we too often live in silos, and I think um, the message here is we can both learn from each other. We're sort of telling our business students the same thing. You need to go out there and learn some science as well. Um, take advantage of the resources, mentoring programs, accelerators, incubators. We have them here at Penn State. Uh, the, the launch box is an example. The Happy Valley launch box, box is an example, and that's just the beginning. Um, that was also pointed out. Uh, and so. Um, then finally, I'll just end on this demonstrate intellectual curiosity. I can't tell you how much I love the concept of curiosity as a, as a way to be an, an innovator and entrepreneur. Ask questions, identify gaps, question assumptions. These are things that make um, people successful, though it's risky. Um, so that's my, those are my takeaways, and I appreciate that you shared that with me tonight.
Um, let's please um, all give them a warm uh, round of applause for what's been given to you. Thank you so much.